So if you recall, when we had begun the Civil War storyline, we had talked about how Civil War Frontline was going to have some of the best storytelling out of all the comics that were released as part of the Civil War event. And you know, Civil War Frontline issue number five really kind of stands the test of that. It really kind of gives us a fantastic set of events, especially when we're looking at the involvement of uh, Sally Floyd and Ben Urich. And what we see as the comic begins to open is that Ben Urich is attempting to convince J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robertson that the Green Goblin has returned, but neither of them believe him. Uh, we really kind of see a flashback where we see the events after Ben Urick and Green Goblin came face to face, and the Green Goblin is really angry. Norman Osborn is really upset with uh, Ben Urick and the Daily Bugle about the things they had written about him that had helped to lead to his incarceration. And we see that, that uh, the Green Goblin really kind of indicates, not necessarily directly, but indirectly, that he has plans to take vengeance against the Daily Bugle. From there, we switch to Sally. Sally Floyd, and Sally Floyd is in Chinatown, and what we see is that some individual approaches her from behind and really kind of follows her and talks to her. Now, this individual says that Sally Floyd does not know who he is, and Sally Floyd can't actually see him, but this individual really kind of gives us a very interesting set of events, really kind of uh, has some great, I guess, conversation with Sally, and what we see is that this individual tells Sally that the story that she's going with, that all these underground superheroes are attempting to make contact with Captain America. America's team is the wrong story to go with because Captain America doesn't exist anymore. You know, that none of the people that are part of this team that are part of Captain America's team exist anymore. And this is really kind of pointing to the secret identities that Nick Fury had given to uh, Captain America and Daredevil and the other members of his team that we had seen in uh, previous events of Civil War. In addition, what we see is that this individual really kind of tells Sally, uh, Sally Floyd that, that someone out there, someone who's presumably part of S.H.I.E.L.D., believes that she knows more than she she does, that she does actually know how to get a hold of Captain America, and because of that, she's being followed. We then see Sally Floyd uh, open her makeup kit and look in her mirror, and we see that someone is standing on a rooftop monitoring her. Now, whether, the, whether or not this individual knows that she's actually having a conversation with the person behind her, or maybe just thinks her actions are suspicious, we don't really know. We simply know that someone is following her, and that in fact, this individual was most likely the person that had tipped S.H.I.E.L.D. off to the previous meeting that she was uh, discovered in. Uh, that we had uh, talked about in the, the previous uh, Civil War Frontline issue number four event. From there, we really kind of uh, see this individual individual telling t uh, Sally Floyd that the problem with her story, the problem with this approach that she's taking, is that she's really kind of looking for a conspiracy where none exist. That she's really kind of taking the stance that there's got to be some kind of hidden hand. There's got to be some kind of person from the shadows that's manipulating all these events and really kind of setting things the way they are. And then, in fact, there is no hidden hand. There is no conspiracy. And that this is simply just the government at, uh, attempting to create create a bill to really kind of, or I guess uh, passing a bill, to really kind of regulate superheroes. The time has finally come when superheroes simply just can't act of their own accord. That there has to be some kind of rules laid down, but the problem is that S.H.I.E.L.D. and Iron Man and other members who are part of the pro-registration movement are really kind of screwing it up. We see that Sally Floyd attempts to turn around and ask this individual more questions, but he has disappeared before she can do that. What we also see is that, uh, kind of a, a switchback I guess to Ben Urich, and Ben Urick is again continuing to attempt to convince J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robertson that uh, Green Goblin has returned. But then we see that one of the staffers appears and tells uh, J. Jonah Jameson that he's confirmed with Iron Man and other uh, maybe independent sources that uh, the Green Goblin is still locked up. Now we know this is not the case. Of course, we saw that S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, asked Green Goblin in a previous comic if he was willing to play by a new set of rules. And so this is really kind of the indication that while previous Previously, we may have felt a little bit sorry for Tony Stark. Previously, we may have looked at Tony Stark and said, you know, he might be in kind of a bad situation because he's doing the best we can. This is when we see Tony Stark really kind of engaging in some very shady uh, actions, really kind of engaging in some very shady things. At least that's the presumption that we're given. At this point, we don't actually know if uh, Tony Stark has verified the fact that uh, Norman Osborn is still in prison, if he's really kind of lied and made this statement. But given the fact that as far as we can tell, she 
Field released Green Goblin, this really kind of seems to be the case. Now, what we see is that Ben Urich really kind of begins to scream at J. Jonah Jameson. He really kind of you know tells J. Jonah Jameson that he's a coward because he's not willing to look further into this whole Norman Osborn Green Goblin issue because he's afraid of Green Goblin. Uh, at this point, J. Jonah Jameson kind of calls out Ben Urich and asks him if he's finished. And when Ben Urich says yes, then J. Jonah Jameson fires him. Now, from this point, we switch back to Sally Floyd, and she's with her editor, Neil Crawford. And Neil Crawford is really asking if she has any sources for the story that she is submitting. And the fact the story that she's submitting is the very story that she was told not to run, that there is some kind of conspiracy here, that there is some kind of hidden hand here, and that these superheroes are attempting to make contact with Captain America's team. Of course, she says that none of these superheroes are going to come forward to verify this information. And so the Daily Bugle really just kind of has to take it that it's absolutely true. What we also see taking place is that Eric Marshall appears with several S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. And if you recall our uh, previous videos when we had talked about the early uh, comics of Civil War Frontline and the instances where Robbie Baldwin was in prison, that uh, Eric Marshall was one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents or the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent that had informed him that he had, uh, that the, the connection between his brain and his superpowers had been lost, that uh, he was under arrest and so on and so forth. Um, Eric Marshall informs Sally Floyd that she was discovered or she has been identified as uh, having met with unregistered uh, superheroes and did not come forward and report them. Now, Sally Floyd and uh, Neil Crawford really kind of hide behind the Constitution here and really kind of say that they have, uh, they're really kind of exonerated from any kind of charges of this caliber because the Constitution provides the press with the ability to, one, hide their sources so they can maintain a free flow of information without fear of prosecution, and two, uh, because the freedom of the press is one of the last bastions of a free society. Society. But we see that Eric Marshall combats this by saying that those rules don't apply anymore. Uh, what we see is that Sally Floyd and Neil Crawford don't comply. They refuse to reveal their sources. And so Eric Marshall places Sally Floyd and Neil Crawford under arrest for, um, I guess, harboring unregistered uh, superheroes or refusing to report them, and for acts of terrorism. Now, from here, we switch to Robbie Baldwin and She-Hulk, or Jennifer Walters acting as the lawyer for Robbie Baldwin. And what we see is uh, that, that Robbie Baldwin is being transported to a new facility. And as they're moving along the way, uh, She-Hulk really kind of tells him that this new facility is someplace called the Negative Zone. Now, the Negative Zone is a very important part of Marvel Comics because it appears off and on. It was actually something that first appeared in the Fantastic Four issue number 51 in 1966. And the negative zone is basically a parallel Earth. It's another dimension. And what we see is that a massive prison has been built inside the negative zone. And the purpose of this prison is to house all superheroes who refuse to register or anyone who is found guilty of being an unregistered uh, superhero. This may very well include individuals who are registered, but for some reason have lost their registration credentials. Now from here, we switch to uh, to the story of Joe. We really kind of get back into the story of, of Joe and the sleeper agent, uh, a, a member of the Atlantis royal family. And what we see is that Wonder Man is really kind of filming an infomercial, uh, really kind of filming a, uh, a commercial design to inform, uh, I guess, the general community, the human population of the relationship that will exist between superheroes and the government in the sense that the superheroes will basically be a kind of police force and that the 50 state initiative, which is the intention of Reed Richards and S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and Iron Man and the government to have a uh, government sanctioned superhero team in all 50 states, that it will really kind of work in a way to where superheroes heroes will be a police force, that they will be a uh, force for good, as opposed to, uh, for the most part, vigilantes, which up to this point is how they've been perceived by society. And what we see is that once Wonder Man gets back to uh, his location, that uh, he meets with S.H.I.E.L.D., and S.H.I.E.L.D. really kind of performs some under underhanded tactics here. Of course, they inform him about Joe, and, and we learn that S.H.I.E.L.D. had been monitoring Joe for several years because Joe had gone by several aliases, he had gone by several names, and that there was just something kind of off about him that really kind of caused red flags to pop up on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s radar. Now, initially, Wonder Man doesn't really see this as something that he needs to be involved in. It's really kind of something that's below him, and for the most part, it is. But because of the fact that he has a, a relatively unique set of powers, because of the fact that he is, for the most part, uh, and I guess exceeds the abilities that virtually all Atlanteans possess, that S.H.I.E.L.D. really kind of blackmail, uh, blackmails him into investigating Joe. They really kind of blackmail him into uh, pursuing 
what is going on with Joe, where he's gone to, and so on and so forth. Now, the way they do this is really by telling Wonder Man that the history that Wonder Man has is that he's really kind of been embezzling money from charities, and S.H.I.E.L.D. is willing to make it go away as long as Wonder Man will do what they ask. And the comic really kind of comes to an end where we see that Wonder Man's hands are more or less tied here, that unless he wants to uh, face criminal charges for embezzlement, that he is actually going to have to act on behalf of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, while this isn't necessarily the most uh, interesting part of the uh, Civil War event, while it's not necessarily the most action-packed, it is one of the most important. And the reason why is because initially the idea was that S.H.I.E.L.D. was going to work with superheroes, that the the superhero community that was registered and S.H.I.E.L.D. and the federal government were really going to kind of collaborate with each other. But what we see is that S.H.I.E.L.D. is really kind of doing things the way they want to do it. They're really kind of doing things their own way. And that either superheroes can collaborate or they can face the possibility of being sent to the negative zone. And this is a very important aspect of the events of Civil War as we begin to move forward with the story. So Miss Marvel issue number six is a very well put together comic book. And in fact, Miss Marvel is one of the premier superheroes in Marvel comics, which is really kind of ironic because we've never really talked about her. We've never really had an in-depth Marvel explained video about Miss Marvel, which is of course something that we will do. But what's really kind of interesting about Miss Marvel is, you know, despite the fact that she's as powerful as she is, that she has effectively all the powers of Superman more or less in, in Marvel comics, that she has flight, she has super strength, she has super speed, she has durability and all that different kind of stuff. She's a character who's very complicated. She's a character that's always really kind of kind of looking for acceptance. She's always really kind of looking for a way to establish herself as more than just kind of a sidekick to somebody else. And this was really kind of interesting when we saw her in the Avengers. But what we see as far as the uh, Civil War event is that she is staunchly on the side of Iron Man. She really isn't one of these individuals that kind of wavers and is kind of unsure whether or not she's doing the right thing. While she does, uh, she's not necessarily like militant in the sense that she is kind of imposing her will on people. She's one of these individuals that believes that it's ultimately going for the greater good. Now, as the story really kind of unfolds, what we're going to see going on here, what we're going to see kind of progressing is that not everyone who is against the Superhuman Registration Act is openly against it. What I mean here is that there are some individuals who are working against Iron Man while pretending to be part of Iron Man's group. And as the story begins to unfold, we see that Miss Marvel and shield are attempting to track down a superhero named prowler now uh, prowler is really kind of kind of interesting uh hobie brown is one of these superheroes that isn't necessarily uh, inherently powerful meaning that he doesn't really have any powers of his own he actually uses technology to really kind of uh, enhance himself to really kind of make himself a superhero and what we see is that uh, Miss Marvel and S.H.I.E.L.D. are able to successfully capture him and they take him back to Rikers Island for interrogation. Now one of the things that I really enjoy about these comics is that Marvel is really kind of put in here more or less kind of an ability or the the chance for us to look at these characters and to see what their inherent powers are, what kind of aliases they've had, and what stance they take with regards to superhuman registration. And this I think is a very important thing because as the Marvel Civil War event really kind of progresses, unless you're paying very close attention or unless we're doing something like we are here where we're kind of explaining the events as they uh, as they progress, you might really kind of find yourself getting lost. You might really kind of find yourself being shuffled around and not really sure uh, who stands for what or which side anybody's on. And so Marvel's really kind of giving this information, albeit it's really kind of confined to the characters in this comic book. And what we see as we continue along with this story is that uh, Marvel, uh, I'm sorry, Wonder Man meets with Carol Danvers as they are going to be heading to Stark Tower and that they're actually kind of running late. And as they get to Stark Tower, we see that Julia Carpenter, who is one of the many women in Marvel Comics that will play the role of Spider-Woman, is uh, meeting with them and really kind of, uh, I guess, letting them know that Spider-Man himself is running late. Spider-Man, I'm sorry, uh, Iron Man is, is running late. Iron Man finally arrives and he really is kind of dishing out orders to people. As these individuals are part of the superhero recovery team, 
their roles are exactly what it sounds like. Their job is to go around with S.H.I.E.L.D. and to capture individuals who refuse to register. And what we see is, of course, he's really kind of applauding them that they have successfully been able to catch um, uh, uh, the Prowler. And we really kind of see Iron Man stating that Captain America's actions with regards to going underground, his uh, guerrilla warfare tactics against S.H.I.E.L.D. and Iron Man have really kind of spurred people on and have really kind of given those individuals who have chosen not to register kind of a rallying person so that they can really kind of make their own plans and hopefully come into contact with Captain America at some point in time, which is something that Iron Man is trying to keep from happening. One of the things that he assigns to uh, Miss Marvel and to Wonder Man is to capture someone named Aranya. Now, we don't really know who Aranya is uh, as far as these particular comics. Um, we know that Aranya at some point played the role of Spider-Girl, but between 2004, 2005, when she made an appearance, and now, we don't really know what she's doing. I mean, she had a 12-issue limited run, but for the most part, she was a very obscure character in Marvel Comics to a degree. We really didn't see her pop up a whole lot. And Iron Man goes as far as to say this. He says that they have an idea of where she's operating from. They have an idea of what it is that she's doing, but they don't really know anything about her. They don't know uh, what physical form she may take on aside from the kind of insect form that we see in the uh, the hologram that he's presenting to them. Now, as far as uh, Julia Carpenter, he assigns her the role of capturing Max Coolidge. And Max Coolidge goes by the name of Shroud, and he's able to use some kind of dark energy, I believe, to really kind Kind of uh, aid him while he's combating people. And what we see as the comic really kind of continues is that Iron Man pulls Carol Danvers aside, pulls Miss Marvel aside, and begins to ask her about Captain America, about whether or not Captain America had ever ever tried to contact her. At this point, we really kind of jump back to a meeting that had taken place between Captain America and Carol Danvers. And Captain America is really kind of uh, talking to her about how the law is unjust, and he's not necessarily going as far as to say, I want you on my side, although we know that that really is the case, that Miss Marvel would be an excellent ally for anyone to have, but he's really kind of kind of making an argument to her that what's going on here just isn't really fair. But Miss Marvel goes as far as to say that the country is based on the idea of laws, and whether or not the laws are right or wrong, you have to follow them. Just because you disagree with the law doesn't mean it gives you the right to break it. If you disagree with the law, you should go through the political process of trying to get the law changed. From there, we jump back to Carol Danvers as she's speaking with um, uh, Tony Stark, and she says that she doesn't really know where Captain America is. She doesn't really know what it is that he's doing, which for the most part is a true statement. Now, we see that she eventually meets up with Wonder Man, and the two of them begin their assignment of attempting to capture um, Ar Aranya. Now, from there, we switch to Rikers Island, and we see that a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent is interrogating Hobie Brown Prowler. And what's really kind of interesting here is this is when we begin to see that not everyone who is trying to uh, defeat the Superhuman Registration Act is doing so in the same fashion as Captain America. We see that this individual is kind of interrogating Hobie Brown, and what we see is that he's talking, uh, he, he really kind of brings up the idea that someone tipped Hobie Brown off. Someone told him that, um, that that S.H.I.E.L.D. was going to be coming for him and that they had arrived at his apartment about five minutes after he had left, fully in disguise. And he really kind of hounds him. He really kind of pushes towards him. He really kind of uh, pulls out every stop in order to draw this information from him. He goes as far as to say that they'll drop him into a hole. He'll never see the light of day again. They'll take his family away, so on and so forth. And finally, Hobie Brown admits to the person that gave him the information that tipped him off. And what we see <clears throat> is that this person is Julia Carpenter. Now, from there, we switch to Julia Carpenter, who's meeting with Max Coleridge. And she's really kind of trying to tell Max Coleridge that S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to come after them, that she is the one that's supposed to capture him, and that if she doesn't bring them in, then her, her cover is really going to kind of be blown, that S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to be aware of the fact that she is more or less kind of a double agent, so to speak. And what we see is that... Hobie Brown is not okay. I'm sorry that uh, Max Coolidge is not okay with this. That Max Coolidge is uh, he's really kind of against the idea of um, of Julia Carpenter. I guess both maybe revealing her identity and really kind of taking a stance that would put her in peril. And so he tells her, you need to take me in. Now, Julia Carpenter is avidly against this. Julia Carpenter really doesn't want to have to take Max in. And Max really kind of tries to rationalize with her and say that you have a daughter, you have more concern, you have more to worry about than I do. But ultimately, we see that Julia Carpenter turns against S.H.I.E.L.D. From this point moving forward, Julia Carpenter is now a fugitive, and she is branded that way by uh, the S.H.I.E.L.D. files on 
on her as an individual. From here, we transition back to Miss Marvel and Wonder Man, and we see that uh, they're really kind of hunting around. They're really kind of looking for uh, Aranya. They're in the general vicinity from where she's acting, but they don't really know where to find her at. They come across a restaurant called Chicken Cow, I believe, and I'm not really sure what kind of a restaurant this is supposed to be a play on, but I would most likely say it's like a KFC or a Chick-fil-A or something like that. But we see some witty banter between the two of them. We see that Miss Marvel says she hasn't eaten here in quite some time, and uh, Wonder Man is a little flirty when he says he's kind of amazed that she's able to keep her figure, despite the fact that she eats food like this. <clears throat> From here, we switch to the events that are going on inside the restaurant. And for the most part, it doesn't really seem too crazy. It really kind of seems like some a really slow moment in the comic, and we're really kind of expecting something more to happen. And something actually does. What we see is that a group of thieves break into the place, and they begin to try the process of robbing it. And we see one of them point a gun at Miss Marvel, and she kind of laughs this off, because as we know, Miss Marvel would not be affected by a bullet. In addition, we see that one of the individuals really kind of begins to manifest themselves. They really kind of begin to present themselves as a superhero of sorts, although they're trying their best to keep it under control. Miss Marvel and Wonder Man are able to defeat the criminals with the slightest of ease. And then we see this individual uh, break out and ask them, is there anybody that wants a piece of them? And then that's when it's revealed to us that this is in fact the person they've been looking for the entire time. Thank you.